Hey everyone, welcome to Signal Processing with Paul. And in this video, I'm gonna explain what signals and systems actually are. Let's start with signals. Now really, a signal is just a function that conveys some sort of information. And here, information is broadly and generally defined as to make our analysis super general. Now, while this notion of a signal is so broad it may seem useless, the fact that it is so general is actually helpful because it means any of our reasoning about signals applies to any possible signal or as many possible signals as possible. And this is a process called abstraction, where we remove specific details about our problem in question to focus on a really broad class of things so we can apply what we learn to many different cases. And often what we find is abstracting beyond the very specific problem details makes our analysis even easier. Now, because a signal is a function, it depends on an independent variable. So the signal basically tells us how some value responds as the variable in question changes. And this variable here can represent time, space, the price of something, and a lot more. So really, signals take in a value for their independent variable, and then they sort of return a value. So in this example above, suppose you put in 7,000 for the time variable, putting that into X will basically give you its amplitude at that particular time value, it kind of like looks it up, if you will. In many cases, these signals are functions of a variable that represents time in pretty much almost all cases. And this allows us to represent things that vary with time, like say audio signals, stock prices, temperature, light intensity, and a lot more. And when we write a signal, we often put what it depends on in parentheses to tell us it's related to some other quantity or variable. So when we write X of T, we're saying that our signal X changes with time or is a function of time. That's usually how it's read. Now let's move on to systems. Now systems are also functions. However, rather than taking in values, systems take in signals and output signals. In other words, a system takes in signals does something to them or processes them, and then outputs one or more signal at the end. Signals and systems are at the heart of signal processing. Signals are the things you're doing the processing on, and systems are the things doing the actual processing. So the two go together quite naturally. Now, one point about notation is we often use lowercase letters like X and Y to represent signals and capital letters, especially the letter H, to represent systems. And with this notation, we can write the output y of t of a system h acting on an input x as y of t equals h of x of t. And notice how our system h takes in a signal x and produces an output signal y. And our signals x and y themselves take on a time value and produce an output value. So you can in that case think of systems almost like meta functions. They're functions that take in functions and return other functions. It's very common also to see inputs represented by X of T and outputs represented by Y of T. That's just very common standard notation. So if you see X, usually it's an input going into a system and Y it's usually considered an output going out of a system. When drawing signals and systems, we often use what is called a block diagram where signals are represented by lines or arrows and systems are represented by boxes or blocks. The arrows going into a system represent the system's input or inputs, whereas arrows leaving a system represent the system's outputs. And most of the time these go left to right, like reading on a page where the inputs go into a system from the left and the outputs come out from the right, but sometimes it goes in the other direction as you see in the block diagram here. And usually when you do see that, there's some reason for it, such as a feedback loop. More on that in a second. For a concrete example, suppose you wanna get rich and you wanna decide what to invest in, but you need to be able to predict how stocks will perform to know exactly what you should be spending your money on. So in this case, let X of T be a function representing how the stock has performed in the past, and let Y of T be a function representing how the stock will perform in the future. Both are functions of time, but the reason we split it up like this is we don't know how things are gonna perform in the future. So what we're trying to do is predict or estimate why. This is why we split it up into two different functions. We're trying to do the estimation so we can make a decision. So let's create a system H that takes in how the stock has performed in the past and predicts how it will perform in the future. In this case, our system H represents the prediction mechanism. It outputs a new signal predicting how the stock will perform that takes into account how it has behaved previously. So when we design H, we should probably take into account past stocks and how they performed so we can test the effectiveness of our prediction system H. Our goal is to design H to make Y as accurate as possible. And perhaps we'd even want to design our system so it updates its prediction in real time as a stock performs either well or not. Now, when one of the outputs of a system is also one of its inputs, we have what's called a feedback loop, where the output is fed back into the system as an input. This usually means the system also depends on its own state or the output from a previous time. One simple example of this is a temperature control system, which is a system that consists of two things, a thermostat and an AC unit. 
These can each be considered their own systems, but here it makes sense to think of them as subsystems of a larger system. So the thermostat takes in the current temperature in the room and the desired temperature, and it outputs a control signal. The AC unit takes in the control signal as its input, and it changes the temperature. It outputs a new temperature for the room in question. However, this new temperature will become the current temperature in the room, which is then fed back into the system. So if the system is designed properly, this feedback loop will allow the system to stabilize or converge to the desired temperature. Feedback loops are super common and are also the basis of like supervised machine learning, where you're trying to make some input map or look like some particular output, some desired output that you have. Now, systems can and often do have multiple input and output signals, which we represent with multiple arrows and sometimes subscript with numbers if needed. So here we have a system containing three inputs and two outputs, which we represent as H of X1, X2, X3 equals Y1, Y2. And signals themselves can take in multiple inputs and have multiple outputs as well. These are called vector valued signals. These kind of signals are often called MIMO or multi-input, multi-output. One thing that may be helpful to remember is systems with multiple outputs can often be broken into smaller systems, each producing a single output. So whether you represent a system with a single system or with a set of subsystems as we're doing here is really just depending on what your goal is. So in this case, we're splitting up H into H1 and H2 to make things a little bit easier to understand. And similarly with signals, signals with multiple outputs can usually be broken into smaller signals, each producing a single output, though these outputs may still depend on multiple inputs. One more thing, signals are either continuous or discrete, which refers to whether there are gaps between the values or not. And really, more technically, it has to do with whether the domain of your signal is the continuum, like the real numbers, or discrete, like the integers. So one example of a real signal is x of t equals cosine of 2 pi 1 over 10 t, where the time variable t is defined over a subset of the real number line. An example of a discrete signal is x of n equals cosine of 2 pi 1 over 10 n, where n is a sample index which takes on integer values from 1 to 25. So here we have continuous and here we have discrete. One thing about notation is we usually use parentheses to designate continuous signals and brackets to designate discrete signals. You remember this because discrete signals aren't smooth, they're kind of blocky or jumpy, just like the bracket symbol, whereas parentheses are smooth curves, just like real valued signals often are. Though I should mention that to make these plots, I had to use discrete valued signals to get them both to fit into a computer. So signals represented in computers are pretty much always discrete. Anyway, thanks for watching, and in the next video, we'll talk about linearity.